right, you can be seated, and uh, I guess, David, if you want to go back there. Okay, and so hopefully we'll have enough young people back there after the invitation. They're going to come in here and do a little bit, a little prevent, uh, presentation, and I uh, really look forward to that. Amen. And uh, we've got... Uh, you know, a couple of really good young men here. Uh, David is from Los Angeles area, and Jake here is a home homegrown boy. Amen. <laughs> York County, right? And so, it's great to have him. I always like to give young preachers opportunities to preach, and uh, so I'm glad that he was he was willing to to say, yeah, I'll do that. And that's how I really know. That's how I know if a guy's called to preach. If I say. How would you like to preach? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Nah, God didn't call you. <laughs> but if you're eager to do it, yeah, yeah. We're, that's step one. There's several other steps, but that's step one, the eagerness, the willingness. And it's been great getting to know you, brother. So if you want to come, and I got it right here. It says, preach the word. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate it. You can go to Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter number 5. As Pastor said, uh, I'm be the teen evangelist for MBT this week. So it's been a lot of fun getting just to travel around and see a bunch of different churches, uh, get to know a lot of different people, a lot of different pastors, and just laying in the church serving God. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning, Pastor. I thank you for that. I'm uh, looking forward to getting to know you guys this week, getting to know the teens and um, just having fun this week. Um, Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 14. We'll look at verse 14 through 16. Uh, Matthew chapter number 5, verses 14 through 16 says this, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I'll start the service off with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for an opportunity to be in your house and hear your word preached this morning. I just pray now that you bless the message this morning, Lord. And I just pray that you would help the MBT rally this week, Lord. Pray that you would um, use this message to stir hearts. And in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Matthew chapter number 5, verse 14 through 16. You've probably heard these verses before, you've probably heard messages preached on it, but the basic concept is you are the light of the world, and that's what I want to talk about, I want to preach on that topic this morning, you are the light of the world, you are and I am the light of the world, and that falls on us, that falls on you and that falls on me, that we are the light of the world, and we should be the light of the world, we are God's choice to be the light of the gospel to our lost and dying world. Can you imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus preach? I don't think he ever misspoke. Always knew what he was going to say. Always had his thoughts finished. Always prepared. I would love to hear Jesus preach. But you know, we don't get to hear Jesus preach. But we get to hear pastors and we get to hear people who have dedicated their lives to serving God. We get to hear them preach. People who desire to hear the word of God. And the Bible says, you know, when Jesus was done preaching after he was done, that the people marveled at him. That's how good he was at preaching. And I want to be like that. I don't want people to marvel at me. But I want to preach like Jesus did. That's what I want to do. That's my heart's desire. Matthew chapter number 7, verse 28 says this, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. It was in this sermon that Jesus said the startling words to the people that were following him. Ye are the light of the world. They didn't know what to think about that. They knew that Jesus was their teacher. They knew they should follow Jesus. But when he said to his people that were there that ye are the light of the world, he didn't know what to think. What do you mean we are? Why are we the light? Well, let's look at it. God could have chosen many different ways to show himself to his lost and dying creation. He could have chosen many different ways to do it. He could have used angels, animals, rocks crying out. He could have done a bunch of different things. But he didn't do that. He chose people. He chose Christians to spread the gospel. Christians like you 
Christians like me. Christians all over the world, each in their own country, their own language. But that's who he chose to spread the gospel. And it started with Jesus himself. And ever since then, 2,000 years later, here we are, still spreading the gospel. Or at least we should be. Because we are to be the light of the world. If we don't go, who else will? We are to be the light of the world. The passage compels all believers to get the message of the gospel out to a lost and to a dying world. So first of all, the first point is the assignment. What is our assignment? If we're the light of the world, what does that assignment mean? Well, we see it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 2. Um, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So he's teaching his disciples. We're to be disciples of Christ. We're not the original 12 disciples, but we should still be God's disciples. And God was talking to his disciples. A disciple is a person who has believed in Jesus and has chosen to follow him. So speaking to these disciples that met those requirements, people that had trusted Christ as their Savior and chose to follow him, he said, you are the light of the world. So if you're here this morning and you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you've chosen to follow him, you are the light of the world. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, then you can't be the light of the world because you don't have Jesus with you. He's not a part of you. He's not there with you. Jesus is the light, and he's to shine through us. So it's a very important assignment. I was in college, and I had to take Greek. So my second year, I'm there, and I'm taking Greek. And it comes down, I had two word studies that I put off and put off and did not do. Well, I came down, and the finals took the finals, and I'm studying for another final the day after I'd taken my Greek final, and my teacher texts me, and he says, you never turned in your two word studies. And I said, that's not good. This is not good. I have to pass Greek to graduate. And I don't want to have to take Greek senior year. And I'm thinking this through my mind. I'm like, this is not good. He said, uh, if, if you get them into me by Wednesday, uh, you'll, you'll get a C, you'll pass. I'm like, oh, good. He goes, but if you don't get those in, you'll get a D. And a D is not a passing grade. It does not count a D. You can't graduate with a D on a, in Greek. You have to have a C. I'm like, uh, this is not good. This is Tuesday afternoon. So I have to do two Greek word studies by Wednesday night. So I'll tell you what, I got busy. Because if I didn't get these done, I was going to fail that class. And I did not want to have to take Greek again. It was very important. I was not thinking about anything else. I went and I asked my friends that had taken Greek classes. I said, what did you do? How did you do it? They helped me, and I got it done. And a day, when one of the, those evenings, I got both of those word studies done. Because it was important to me. I had to get it done or else I was going to fail that class. I had motivation. Well, our, import, our, uh, our assignment to be the light of the world is an important assignment. It should be just as important. It should be more important than me graduating or uh, passing that Greek class. That yeah, was important to me. I didn't want to have to take it again. Well, God told us to be the light of the world. That should be important to us. If God told us to do something, that should be important to us. We should want to do that. It's important to the military that they follow their assignments. They're given direct orders to save people's lives, how they're supposed to um, uh, breach buildings, how they're supposed to do it. They have an order that they're supposed to do everything because it's very important. If they don't want to lose their life, they have to follow that plan. It's very important they follow their orders. They get in big trouble if they don't follow their orders. Well, God's orders are more important than the military's orders. And am I following God's orders for my life? Are you following God's orders for your life? The assignment is to be the light of the world, to spread the gospel. Am I doing that? Are you doing that? That's the question this morning. The Greek pronoun you was used as an emphatic, which means you alone. That means that it's you and no one else. You can't count on anyone else. You don't know if your friend's going to do it. You don't know if your sibling's going to do it. You can't count on them. But you know that you will choose to be the light of the world or not to be. You can't, you can't choose for anyone else. You have to decide, am I going to be the light that God tells me to be? That can only happen if you're saved. 
You can't share the light, you can't share the gospel if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. It's like me trying to teach Greek to you if I don't understand Greek, if all I know is English. I can't do it because I don't know. I can't teach you the gospel unless I know that I'm saved. If I know that I'm saved, then I can spread that gospel. Then I can spread Jesus' light because I know without a doubt that I'm saved. It's just us Christians. No one else, is, no one else can do it. Animals can't do it. Unsaved people, God can use them, but they can't be a light because they don't have the light in them. The Holy Spirit, that's what lets the light shine through us. Valley Forge, many of you know about Valley Forge. George Washington had his men. There he had 12,000 men. Um, and they stopped in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, December 19th of 1777. They decided to spend the winter there. 12,000 men fighting in the War for Independence. And these men, they had decided they were going to fight no matter if they died, no matter if they got wounded. They wanted their independence, and they had determined they were going to do it, no matter what happened. That winter was one of the most brutal winters. They had men, half of those uh, men, they didn't even have clothes. Like one, in, I think it said one in three men had shoes. They didn't have proper clothes for winter. They didn't have proper food, but they stuck it out. And many died. Many got sick that summer. I'm sure many died from frostbite, from malnutrition, diseases, but they stuck it out. And those 12,000 men, many died. But by June, they moved out of Valley Forge. Uh, according to this, over 2,500 people had died of mal malnutrition, exposure, and disease. But they knew that that army had to hold on, because who else was going to do it? If they wanted to win their independence, who else was going to do it? There was not another army. It was just them. And those men, they held on. They made it through that winter, and they went on to win the War for Independence, because they determined that they were going to do it. They weren't going to give up when things got tough. They weren't going to give up when winter came. They had made up their mind. Well, we're supposed to be the light of the world. Have you made up your mind that you're going to do that? Have you decided that, you know what? I'm going to share this with my coworkers. They're asking me why I can't work on Wednesday nights instead of just saying I have stuff to do. Well, it's because I'm going to be at church. Sunday, I've got to be at church. And it's because I believe in Jesus. Have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? When was the last time you asked someone about that? Before I went to college, I really didn't share the gospel. But I went to college, and God got a hold of my heart. He said, are you going to be selfish and just keep it to yourself, or are you going to spread it? Are you going to tell others about what I did for you? It's very important. He, Jesus isn't saying that you will be the light or that you can be the light, but you are the light. You are that light. You're not going to be. You are now. If, you're, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you are the light. Ephesians 5, verse 8 says this, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. Our text in verse 15 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. There's an illustration right there. A city set on a hill can't be hid. Uh, Pastor Kent Hughes said this, having traveled a little in Ecuador, I can testify that the light of the city of Quito, situated at 10,000 feet, illumines the sky for 75 miles around. Just a little city. But when the darkness was all around, it was set on a hill. It was above everything else. And just a little light could be seen for miles around. If you're at work, and maybe all you do is pray before you eat, Maybe you talk to one person. If you're the only saved person there, it's going to spread around. People are going to notice a difference. At least they should if you're living for God. If you are a light, you can't hide in darkness. This city set on a hill, it can't be hit. If you're, if you're determined to serve Jesus, if you're that light and you're above everything else, you won't be able to contain it. Everyone should be able to see it. Believers should be like this city. They should be visible because there's no such thing as an invisible believer. If you trust Christ, everyone should know that. You shouldn't be here this morning like, well, I don't want to tell anyone because they might think something of me. 
What about the God who created the world and gave you a command and an assignment? What's he going to think if you don't follow that? People get excited because they meet a sports fan. They get excited because they get to meet the president or some famous person. But what about the God who created the world? And he's given you an assignment, a special assignment. It's dear to him. What's he going to think if you don't follow that? How much of the light of the gospel can people see in you? Work, home, school, church, doesn't matter where you are, they should be able to tell. You should be able to see that I have the light of God, that I know the gospel, that I want to share it, that I've trusted Christ as my Savior. You should be able to see that in me. I should be able to see that in you if you've trusted Christ as your Savior. Because we're to be the light. The second illustration is a lamp. Houses in Jesus' day, there were usually one room, maybe two rooms, and if you set a candle or a lamp in there, it was going to illumine the whole room. It was enough to see. Well, we're supposed to be like that. We're supposed to illumine the area around us so other people can see. Hey, there's something different about him. I don't know what it is, but that guy, there's something different about him. I don't know why, but he shows up to work on time. Who does that? It's not like they're going to fire you. Why is he up work on time? He gets all his work done. What in the world? Something crazy with that guy. Why is he always smiling? I don't care what he's doing. Why is he smiling? Why is he trying to be nice to me? What in the world? People are going to know. If you are saved, they should be able to tell. It should be different. Um, there's this thing known as candlelit cave tours. People go in a tour and they're given just a candle for light. Some people will take a mirror so that light, they can shine it farther. When you're in that cave and you got just a candle for light, you're not going to be like hiding it behind your back, putting it under something. No, that's going to be out. You're holding it up. You're trying to see. You're shining it around. Well, don't put that light. No one's going to put a candle under a bushel or under a bowl to hide it. Don't try to hide the gospel of Christ. That light's in you. Don't try to hide it. Spread it. Let it go out. There's so many people to reach, it could never be done. That's what some people say. But if all the Christians that were in the world would just be a light where they are, we could reach those people. There's people all over the world. In Bible times, it was Jesus and his 12 disciples. That's how they started. Now there's people all over America, all over the world. If people would just be faithful where they are, we could see many, many souls come to Christ. If you are faithful. It's exciting for me to travel around to different churches, to see people here, the last church, just faithful laymen, people I've never heard of, don't know their names till I go there. This church doesn't know the names of the last people. But I come here and I see a pastor that I've never heard of his name before. Only an hour from my house, but I've never heard of this church before. I've been in this area working. I didn't know there was a church here. I wasn't looking for one. But I got to meet these people. I got to meet people that I didn't know before. I found out there's a church, and I found out, oh, wow, these people are going out soul winning. Brother Moore, man, he's excited. I've got to meet some of you that are just faithful and serving. Don't want a name for yourself, and that's what keeps me going. That's what gets me excited. Not preachers who everyone knows because they're ahead of some college. No, it's the people that no one's heard of, that don't have it easy, that are here faithfully laboring, no matter who comes. And that's why I appreciate the chance to preach this morning. Because he's faithful here. Every morning he's here. Every day he's here, faithful serving. Every Sunday he preaches. It takes a lot of preparation. And I'm thankful for that. He's being a light here in Gettysburg. Am I going to be a light where I am? Are you going to be a light? You know what happens when you have one candle? Yeah, you can see. But when you have a couple candles together, it puts off more light. And you can spread out and illuminate more area. Are you going to be a candle or just when you're at church? You're going to try to hide that. In Bible days, there are spiritual leaders called scribes and Pharisees. And these high-ranking Pharisees or scribes were given the title Nerola, which meant lampstand of the world or light of the world. This title was known for the elite spiritual people, the spiritual leaders. But Jesus turned to his disciples and said, you are the light of the world. These scribes, these Pharisees, they're not teaching what's right. 
But he turned to his disciples. He said, I have taught you what's right. Be the light. You are the light of the world. Jesus was going to die on the cross. He was going to go back to heaven. And now we are to be the light. Many people say uh, that they can't reach the world. You know, they say there's 8 billion people in the world, roughly. And they say that um, 75% of them have never heard the gospel. And I live in America, and I say, how is that possible? Because there's so many churches. It's everywhere. But when I went to college and I was knocking doors, it shocked me, but I came across people that had never been to church and they were in their 40s, that had never heard the gospel in America. What about the other countries? When you live in America, you get sheltered to a lot. I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip to Portugal. And man, I found out that it's hard on a mission field. That uh, missionary, Pastor Newton, he's a missionary to Portugal. He had to come off the field. His wife got cancer. She actually ended up passing away. And he preached at our missions conference 2020 during COVID. They had just come off the field because of his wife. This was before she passed. And he preached the message, and it was at missions conference. It was basically a message of a pastor, a missionary, who was coming off the field. And his heart was with those people. But he couldn't do it anymore. And God was just telling him, will you go? Will you go? You said you want to be a missionary. You said you're surrendered. Will you go? Will you go be a missionary? And I said, yes, God, I will. He was calling. He had to leave that ministry. Who was going to go pick it up? I don't know if anyone's picked it up since. But I remember him preaching from a broken heart. Who was going to go and be that light? I had been there. I had seen what he was talking about. I had seen the church, small church, room not even as big as half of this. It's where they started. They started that church. When we went, we had a missions group of like 20 people. It doubled their attendance. The building was packed. But he was faithful for years. And I want to be faithful. I want to be a faithful light. Notice um, the achievement of the assignment. How can you make it happen? How do I shine like the light of the gospel? How can I shine that light to others? Well, do good works. Good works does not save you. But if you're doing good works, people are going to see, yeah, yeah, there is something different about that person. Do you show love? Do you respond in kindness? Do you get, anno do you get annoyed or don't you get annoyed? Do you serve others? Do you work hard? Are you selfish or unselfish? Do you do gracious deeds? And go on and on and on. How's your attitude? People will know. Wow, that person. Yeah, he's something different about him. You can tell others. Just through your good works, you can be a light. How about just speaking of Jesus? Just using your mouth. It's, I struggle with this. When I'm out, I don't always like to act, invite people to church, you know? It's hard for me sometimes. But I like to, you know, I like to get with those guys at college That'll push me because they'll be like, we go out together and we go out to eat. And they're giving the waiter, the waitress, they're giving them tracks. Well, I tell you, I may be a little nervous, but when I'm with somebody, I don't like being left out. And if someone else is giving tracks, I'm going to be handing out tracks. I'm going to be trying to invite people. So I have to surround myself with those people. Hey, we're having Bible time this week. Will you come? Will you be a light this week, next week, next year? Will you be a light with your life? Be a light to the world. Romans 10, verse 14 says this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You can't count on someone else to do it. How is your family, is your friends, or your coworkers going to hear if you don't tell them? You can't count on anyone else. God's counting on you to be the light. So first of all, we saw the assignment. We're to be a light to this world. It's a calling of God for all believers. But Jesus gives us a caution. So point number two is the caution. Jesus gives two illustrations about the city on a hill and a lamp in the house. And he makes a very clear point. It makes no sense to try and cover that light under a bowl, under that bushel. That doesn't make sense. Because who would do that? Neither should a believer who's the light of the good news of the saving power of Jesus try to hide that. Why would we try to conceal it? Every Christian should be obvious and should display Jesus. So where does the caution come in? If it makes no sense to hide a light, beware of a sinful life. Beware of that. For a Christian to live in sin is contrary to what God intended for us to do. 
Galatians 1 verse 4 says this, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. If you're here this morning, you're like, I don't know what salvation is. I don't know what it means to be saved. Well, that means that you realize you're a sinner. You realize that you've done wrong. You've gone against what God says. And you realize that there's a punishment in a place called hell for that. Salvation is trusting in Jesus. You place your complete trust in him and your complete belief in him to forgive you of your sin and take you to heaven when you die. That's what salvation is. It's very simple. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. Titus 2, verse 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. We should live for God, not for myself, not for pastor, not for the church, but live for God. Live for Him. Live to please Him, not to please myself. Be a light. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. I love this verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you get saved, there ought to be a change. Old things passed away. All things should become new. You're a light now. You're not in darkness. You have the light of the gospel, the light of Jesus. And you can spread that. Christ does not give us a life just to live sinfully on our own. He didn't give us a light to hide it. But he gave us the truth of the gospel to spread it, to spread to everyone, to spread to others. If you live a godly lifestyle, telling others about Jesus is going to be much easier. You know what it's hard to do? It's hard to be one way at church, dress up, you know, be happy at church. Hi, Pastor, how you doing? Hey, it's good to see you. And then go home and live the way we want to. Watch whatever we want to watch, listen to whatever we want to listen to, act the way we want, whatever it is. Because when your coworkers see, wait, didn't he say he went to church on Sunday? But he's at the bar on Saturday night? I don't understand. See, it's hard to be a witness when your life is contrary to the gospel, when you're living contrary to God's word. But if you live according to God's word, it's so much easier to say, hey, why don't you come to church this Sunday? It will change your life. It changed my life. Change my life, it will change yours. But if it hasn't changed your life, they're not going to see that. And it's so much harder to be a light. It's so much harder to be a light if you're not living for God. You have to live for God. That's what being a light is. It's so much easier. Soak in more of Christ and his righteousness so that you have more light to display. I was younger, we used to play with glow-in-the-dark football. You know what happened? That light would wear out after a while. So you know what we do? We set it outside during the day. It'd sit outside, set that football right outside. Set it there. It absorbs that sunlight. When it gets dark, it's been absorbing that light all day. You've got a good hour or two out of that football before it got dark. We live in a dark world. Sunday, you can come to church on Sunday. You can get some light. You can soak in some light. But it's not going to be enough for the whole week. Get in your Bible every day. Get in your Bible when you can. Get light. Get guidance from the Bible. Soak in that light so you can give it out. The more something is used, the more it has to be filled up with fuel. The more you share the gospel, the more you have to fill up. The more you give out, the more you have to take in. The more you work, the more you have to eat. The more you drive your car, the more you have to put gas in it. The more you share the gospel, the more you have to learn, the more you have to take in. Be a light. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 says, But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from the glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Beware of a selfish life. So we saw beware of a sinful life, beware of a selfful, a selfish life. You might not engage in a sinful lifestyle, but are you being selfish? You may live for Christ. I like to think that's what I was doing. I was living for God, but I was being selfish in the aspect of I wasn't telling others about it. I worked with my dad, so a lot of people we worked for, our neighbors, 
people I knew. That's hard. When you're working to be a light to people, you know, when you're there to work, it's hard to say, hey, you know, would you come out to our church this week? It was hard for me because it was people I knew. I was being selfish. I was keeping the light of the gospel to myself. I wasn't giving it out. I wasn't spreading it to others. And I needed to. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 and 8 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of, he- of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. What is keeping you from spreading the gospel? What is it? Is it fear? The Bible just said not to fear. What's going to keep you? Is it the fear of, oh, I don't know what they're going to think? Maybe it's fear of, I don't know what to say. What am I going to say? I'm not a preacher. Well, you don't have to be a preacher to spread the light. You don't have to be afraid. The Bible says not to have the spirit of fear. He will help you if you're willing to follow him. You say, well, I don't know now. Why is he going to help me then? Why would he give you knowledge before you do something of how to do it? You learn by doing something. The more you go out, the more you're going to learn. What is, what is keeping you from spreading the gospel? Fear of being made fun of? Fear of just not knowing? Maybe you just don't know. You've just never done it. Tell you what. Travel on MBT? I didn't know if I wanted to do it. You know how much I knew about MBT? I knew they went to different churches. My pastor traveled, that was all I knew. I didn't know there were separate teens and separate boosters. I knew they got paired with a guy, that was about it. I had no idea what I'd be doing. I had no idea how it worked, what churches I'd go to. And I was talking to my mom, my dad, and I was talking to the dean of men at college, and all three of them said the same thing. Why wouldn't you go? I'm like, uh, I don't know. They're like, is it just because you're scared? Because if it's just because you're scared, you need to go. So guess what I did? I signed up for Bible time. Because I was just scared of the unknown. I'm preaching on a Sunday morning. Uh, that was scary to think about that. The Bible time? You're in college? Huh, I'm going to go preach on a Sunday morning? I don't want to do that. But no, I'm excited to do it. I've gotten the opportunity to do things I never would have got to do. Just because fear was holding me back. Don't let that fear hold you back. That verse. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God will help you. He'll help you be a witness if you ask him to. But you have to ask him. You have to go. Ephesians 5 verse 14 through 16 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. And Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, that's carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Is laziness keeping you from spreading the light? Just, eh, I'm just going to sleep in Saturday morning. Yeah, they're having soul winning at church, whatever. But, you know, I'm, I worked all week. I just want to sleep in this morning. You don't have to do it at a certain time, but you still have to be a light. Find a time that works for you. Find someone to go with to keep you accountable, to be a light. Don't be lazy. Don't be forgetful that, oh, yeah, yeah, man, I, just, I, gotta, I gotta get to the store, I gotta get this, I gotta get back in time for this. You can be forgetful of, wow, that person that just checked me out may never have heard about the gospel. That person that just brought me food, my lunch, they may never have been to church. They may not even know who Jesus is. Don't forget that. Don't forget that not everyone grew up in church. Not everyone knows Jesus is their Savior. One preacher, he put it this way. The most sobering reality in the world today is that people are dying and going to hell today. Are you living in light of this reality or are you so distracted by your own self-absorption? I think about that. Am I going around, yeah, I should tell them. Or am I really thinking, you know, if I don't tell them, who else is going to tell them? If I don't tell that person that they're headed to hell as a sinner, they could die and go there. They could die in a car accident on the way home. If I don't tell them, that needs to be the mentality. If you don't tell them, who else is going to tell them? During the reign of King King Edward in England, several men, they had tried to move the English church in a direction of more of a Bible-based Christianity. These two men, uh, one was Nicholas Ridley and the other was Hugh Latimer. And 
they were great preachers, they had good testimonies, and they lived lives to back up what they preached. They lived what they preached. And they were trying to spread the gospel. Well, Bloody Queen Mary had become queen of England. And she sentenced both of these preachers to death. Both Ridley and Latimer were to be burned at the stake. So they went, they got these men, they tied them up, they went to burn them. These men, you know what they said? Ridley prayed, he said, O Heavenly Father, I give unto thee most hearty thanks that thou hast called me to be a professor of thee, even unto death. I beseech thee, Lord God, have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies. The wood that they were using to burn him was green, and it was like just burning his legs. It wasn't killing him, it, he was just suffering. And he was calling out. But he kept his testimony. They were given a chance to say, you know what, I don't believe in God anymore. And they could live. But no. They said, no, I'm willing to die for God. And he burned at the stake. It's a terrible way to go. Especially if the wood's green and it's just burning your legs and not traveling up your body. One of the people that was watching went over and moved the wood and helped stir it up so it came up his body and he died faster. But those two men encouraged each other as they were dying, as they were being burned, not to give up hope. You know what happened? A lot of England was reached with the gospel. Because two men stood up. They said, hey, this isn't right. We want to base our Christianity off the Bible, and I'm willing to die for it. I'm going to live this way, and I'm willing to die for the way I live. I want to be a light, and I'm willing to die for it. And they did. But in that situation, I don't know that I would say that. I want to. I want to be willing to die for Jesus, but I don't know that I am. I need to be. Are you willing to? I pray that none of you would, but would you be willing to if you were put in that situation? As believers, we're not to live a sinful life or selfish life, but we need to live a spirit-filled life. A life that is spirit-filled that spreads the gospel to others, that shares it. What does that look like? It looks like a lot like being a light just as the text said, be a light, be a light, be a light. There, um, I have an illustration here, one of the MBT evangelists, but I think I actually got to call this guy. Um, one of the guys that trained the teen guys, his name was Matt Galvin, he's an evangelist. And he was helping us. And one of the days he asked the teen guys, he said, hey, would you guys mind um, Call, if we called one of my friends, one of my pastor friends that traveled uh, Bible time, he loves Bible time, and just sing to him. He's got some stuff going on, he had some cancer trouble. Would you mind if we just called him and sing? We're like, yeah, yeah, sure, that'd be fun. So we sang, or we called him, and he told us a story, and I believe it's the same story here. He went to a church. He had two teens Sunday morning, two guys. He preached Sunday morning, and the one got saved. He preached Sunday night, the other one got saved. Amen. Talk about starting from ground zero. He had two guys, they both got saved. But I'll tell you what, he said those guys got on fire. And we went out Monday morning, and we went out at 10, and we went out to get people to come. Those two guys went with him, the two evangelists, the teen guy, uh, this guy that we called, and his booster guy that was with him. And those two teen guys, they went out, and they started inviting their friends. They didn't even stop for lunch. The evangelists were going to stop for lunch. The guy said, you can, we're going to invite more people. They went all the way up until rally time. You know what happened at the end of that week? How many people that had in attendance? They started with two. They had 55 people. 55 teens at the end of that week. You know how many of them got saved? 45 of those people got saved. You know why? Because two teens said, you know what? I just got saved, and I want to go tell my friends. I want to go tell people I don't even know that are in the community about the glorious message of Christ, the gospel, what it means to be saved. I don't know how to leave them, but I know how to get them to church. We're going to have fun tonight. I want to get them in. So they went out. They got busy. All week they invited people. And people came, and they got saved. And they got to say, hey, my friend, they got saved. I got to invite them, and they got saved because I invited them. How awesome is that? Amen. To say, hey, my coworker came to church and got saved because I invited them. Amen. That's the greatest feeling ever is when someone you invited to church comes to know Christ as their Savior. So this week, at the MBT rally, you know, if you know people, invite them. But more importantly, live a life of a light that can be seen. Can people see the light in you? 
We should be able to. So live a life where you are the light. Psalm 115, verse 1. It says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. I don't invite people to church to say, hey, I invited them. That's not why I do it. It's an awesome feeling when it happens. I try to give God the glory. I do it for God. I do it because I don't want to see them in hell. Be a light. The challenge this morning, be a light. It's not just, oh, yeah, yeah, I should be a light. No. If you need to be a light and you've never said that, make a decision. Be the light. Talk to someone to keep you accountable. Be the light of the world. You are the light. There's no plan B. You are it. I'm it. There's, there's no plan B. There's no, well, if this fails, then we'll use something else. No. You are the light of the world. Don't let that light go out. Share it. Set it up high where it can be seen. You are the light of the world. God wants your availability. He doesn't want your ability. He'll give you ability as long as you give him time. So a very simple challenge this morning is to be the light of the world. But you still have to choose to do that. So I'm just going to ask, I don't know what you normally do for invitation, but I'm just going to ask everyone to bow ahead and close their eyes. And I'm going to give a chance for invitation. If you need to make a decision, do it right now. If you want to do it in your seat, if you need to come up, maybe you need to talk to someone and say, hey, will you help me keep accountable? Maybe you want to talk to someone and say, hey, I want to go soul winning once a week. Will you do it with me? But if you need to make a decision to do that, now's a chance. Maybe you've never gotten saved. I'd invite you to come forward this morning. If you're here right now, you don't know Christ is your Savior, we have some people that would love to talk to you about it. But if whatever it is, if you need to make a decision, do it right now. Now's your chance. If you need to come forward, go ahead. If you need to do it, just do it in your seat. I don't know how God works on hearts. But if you need to make a decision, you can do it right now. God will help you if you want him to. But you have to ask him. You have to be willing to go. He wants your availability, not your ability. All right, I'm going to ask, you guys can look up here. Uh, Pastor, I don't know what's next. Um, I don't know if you guys normally sing or Dave is ready to come in. or. Number 237. 237, why do you wait? Standing together, please, hymn number 237, why do you wait? Altar's open, call's been made, are you the light? And if there's something in the way of that light, come get it right this morning, amen? Standing together, please, why do you wait? 237. <laughs> Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throng. Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why not, why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, to gain by a further delay? There's no one to save you but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Do you not feel, dear brother, his spirit now striving within? Oh, why not accept his salvation and throw off your burden of sin? Why not, why not? Why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother, 
the harvest is passing away your savior is longing to bless you there's danger and death in delay why not why not why not come to him now why not why not why not come to him now all right this concludes the just a few more minutes we got the kids going to do a quick presentation so this is julie's church so man so these are all young people so go ahead jay
Great, man. Great, great time. You got, you know, 